Hello, my sisters, and welcome to today's Grade 10 Math Show. As you all know by now, it's our Triple M Day, which can only mean one thing. My sisters, Math Monday. And today, we have a special revision lesson on analytical geometry and finance just for you. We have selected highlights from lessons shown earlier in the term to help you revise this term's work. You can download your notes for today's show from lenextra.co.za forward slash live. Now, it's time to get on with today's lesson. Please post all your comments and questions on our Facebook page, which is facebook.com forward slash LenExtra. Or you can also follow us on Twitter at LenExtra, so we can help you with all your revision. So, this is a question which looks fairly typical, grade teens. This is the kind of thing you're going to start expecting to see in terms of the questions that you will be asked, okay? All right, so we have got a diagram below which is showing two triangles. I've got triangle SRP and I've got triangle PRQ. Okay, so we've got those two triangles over there, and we can quite clearly see what each of the coordinate points are. Okay, those are all the points of each of, each of the letters. Right, first question, show the triangle PRS. Triangle PRS, which is this one over here, is an isosceles triangle. Right, what's an isosceles triangle? A triangle with two equal sides. Okay, so two sides equal, one, the third one not being equal to the other two. So we've got to prove that it's an isosceles triangle. So can you see where the distance formula would come in handy over here? Okay, what we're going to do is use it to prove the length of the side. So let's start. Let's start by working out the length from P to R. So we're going to use our formula and say PR squared is equal to, we're going to take the x-coordinate of the one value minus the x-coordinate of the other squared plus the y-coordinate of the one value minus the y-coordinate of the other squared. Okay, so therefore let's call that x1 and y1, x2 and y2. You'll notice that I label my coordinate points all the time. I'm always writing x1, y1, x2, y2. Do that because it actually helps not make any silly mistakes when you're doing these. Okay. All right. So PR squared is equal to x1, which is 2, minus x2. Now, please watch out there. That is a negative value. So when you subtract a negative, it becomes positive. And y1, which is 6, minus y2, which is 3, and that, again, is being squared. All right, so what have we got? PR squared, which is equal to, that's going to be 4 squared. That's going to be 3 squared. And we have got, there's 16, and that is 9. So my distance from P to R squared is 25, but obviously we don't want to know what PR squared is. We want to know what just PR is. So to do that, we take the square root of 25, which is 5 units. Okay, so my distance from there to there is 5 units. All right, so that's fine. Now we want to work out that length over there. Let's see what we've got in that side. So PS, so now we're looking for the distance, I'm going to do it on the side over here, of PS squared, which once again, we're going to have the same formula, x1 minus x2 squared plus y1 minus y2 squared, okay? Let's do a quick labeling. This one over here, let's call this x1 and y1, and over here is going to be x2 and y2. All right, so x1 minus y1, x1 minus x2 is going to be 2 minus negative 5. 2 minus negative 5, which again becomes positive, don't forget. And I have got y, which is 6 minus 7. So we've got 6 minus 7, and again, that's being squared. So ps squared is equal to, I've got 7 squared, which is going to be 49. And I've got, that's going to be negative 1 squared, which is 1. Okay, so I've got PS squared, which is actually equal to 50. So PS is equal to the root of 50. Okay, so hang on. Right now, that's not in the isosceles triangle, is it? Because one, the two sides are different in length. But we still have one more side to quickly work out. So let's see over here. 
The next side we need to determine is this one. So let's work out what the distance from S to R is, and let's see if we have any joy with that. So my distance from S to R squared formula, x1 minus x2 squared, y1 minus y2 squared. Let's quickly label. I'm going to call this, let's call this x1 and y1, and then we can call that x2 and y2. It doesn't really matter which one you call which, um, as long as you keep the x1 and the y1 together in one coordinate pair, that's fine, okay? So, 5 minus negative 2. 5 minus negative 2, which is going to be 5 plus 2, and I have got 0 minus 3, 0 minus 3. Okay, this is looking promising. I've got a 5 plus 2, which is 7. Okay, that's going to be, am I right, 5? 49, and I've got a 9. No, I think I've made a mistake somewhere in my working out over here. All right, sorry, the silly mistake that was being made is I was using that coordinate over there, which has got nothing to do with triangle SRP, so that was my silly error. But having done the calculations, what we can see in blue here is that the length from S to R, which I hope you guys worked out as well, is also the distance of 5. Okay, so this is what we should write. So making sure you answer the question we write there, therefore... Triangle SRP is isosceles. And the reason being because your distance from S to R is equal to your distance from P to R, which are both equal to 5 units. And as a result, yes, it's an isosceles triangle. Okay, all right, so yeah, absolutely, the question answer, do write units there, please, it is part of the answer. All right, okay, next question, no, we're jumping backwards here. All right, next question with regards to the same diagram. Now what they're wanting us to do, so let's just fill in quickly what we know here. We knew that that distance was 5, and we know that that's 5, and we've actually worked out that that's a root 50 over there, um, which we're going to leave like that for now. Okay, so show the triangle PRS is right angled. Okay, so now we're still looking at this triangle over here, and they're wanting us to prove that it's a right angled triangle. Okay, how would I do that, be bearing in mind that the distance formula is really the only tool that we've actually been taught at this point? I hope that what's coming into your mind is Pythagoras, okay? Bearing in mind that I've now found the length of the three sides of the triangle, if I can prove Pythagoras, or if, it, if I can prove that uh, Pythagoras works, it would make it a 90-degree triangle. So this is what I mean. Let's take that angle over there. Let's, let's assume that's the 90-degree angle, or would it be? Uh, from S to R. No, hang on, sorry, I'm filling in my sides. Let's just take that away. This one over here, SR was 5. And RP. So let's just get our sides correct so we don't make any silly mistakes. Uh, R, P, and S, R were the two that's the same. Right, so S, R, and R, P. So that one over there was 5. This one over here was the root of 50. Okay, so it looks to me like that's going to be the 90-degree angle over there. And bearing, okay, so working with it as that, let's see if we can prove Pythagoras. If this is a right-angled triangle, do you guys agree that we would be able to prove this? My length from S to P squared would have to be equal to my length of SR squared plus my length of RP squared. Okay, that would, be the, that would be the theorem of Pythagoras. So as I've said, if I can get a left-hand side to equal a right-hand side here, it proves it's a 90-degree triangle. So SP is the root of 50, but bear in mind that that is being squared. My length from S to R is 5, and again, it's being squared. My length from R to B is 5, and it's being squared. So the square root of 50 squared, please remember that a square root and a squared cancel each other out. We're left with just 50, which is equal to 5 squared is 25, and 5 squared is 25. So we have got a left-hand side which equals a right-hand side here, which means that your theorem of Pythagoras is true, which therefore means that triangle PRPSRPS is a right-angle triangle.
Okay. All right. And we did that just by using our distance, knowing our distances. Okay. Right. Let's see what else we can do with this triangle knowing distance formulas. The next thing they're asking for is to prove that PRQ is a scalene triangle. So PRQ being the bottom triangle. Okay. So the idea here, guys, is again, we're wanting to prove it's a scalene triangle. So we're wanting to prove that we've got a triangle with three different sides. Okay. So let's quickly put our formula to practice again, and let's actually work out the three different lengths over there. So let's start with my length from, let's make it the color pink, and we're going to start from P to R. So let's call this X1 and Y1. Let's call that X2 and Y2. So PR. So my distance from P to R squared is equal to my X1 minus my X2 squared plus Y1 minus Y2 squared. It's always a good idea, grade tens, to write the formula down first. It just sets you up so you know what needs to be where and you have it clear in front of you. So I would really say write the formula in its standard form down first as a starting point. Okay, so PR squared. From x1, I've got a 2 minus x2. Okay, here again, you've got a negative, so please watch out. Two negatives give you positive. And I've got y1, which was, in fact, we already know this length, minus 3. And in fact, we already worked out earlier that this distance from p to r was 5. So let's not waste any time there. We know that that's 5. Okay. Let's do, let's make this one blue. I'm going to work out the length from here, from P to Q. All right, so in blue, I'm calling that X1 and Y1, and that's going to be my X2 and Y2. Okay, so my distance from P to Q. PQ squared, X1 minus X2 squared, plus Y1 minus Y2 squared. Okay. PQ squared is equal to X1, which is 2, minus X2, which is 5. 2 minus 5 is negative 3, so let's just save ourselves a little bit of time there. That's negative 3. And Y1 minus Y2. Y1, which is 6, minus Y2, which is 0, so that's going to stay just 6, and that is squared. So what have we got here for PQ squared? I've got a 3 squared, which is 9, and I've got a 36. 9 plus 36 is going to give us uh, 45. And the square root, don't forget to square root at the end, guys. Remember, it's the square root, which is giving us the distance of, of PQ, which is root 45. Okay, so PR right now we know is 5. PQ is root 45. I think we are on our way to proving it's a scalene triangle. The three lengths are not the same. All right, last one quickly. We've got this length over here. Okay, so let's, um, let's erase, let's get rid of that so we don't have any confusion. And let's make it in green just so we know which belo what belongs to what. That's X1 and Y1, and that's X2 and Y2. Okay, let's see if we can fit it on the side here. So we're looking for RQ squared. All right, I'm going to save a little bit of time here and not write the formula simply because we're just wanting to get through it. Okay, so negative 2 minus 5, that's going to give us a negative 7, and that is being squared. I've got a 3 minus 0, which is going to stay 3, and that's being squared. So my RQ, I've got a 49 plus 9, and 49 plus 9 is giving us RQ squared, which is, 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 is 49, 59, 58. And the square root of that, I'm going to leave in third form. We all remember the word third form. You leave it in its square root form, is root 58. Okay, so what have we done? We have proven that all three sides are different in length, so therefore, peak, uh, triangle R, Q, what was it? P is a scalene triangle. Okay, all right, and just make that statement at the end so that you have actually answered the question that was being asked of you. Okay. Okay, guys, I hope you're enjoying this revision session. If you're struggling and need some extra help, remember to post on the page facebook.com forward slash learn extra. Now it's time for a break, so don't go away. We'll be right back.
Welcome back from the break. I can't believe that spring is here and soon it will be time to plan for your final exams. Don't stress, exam school is coming in term four. We'll be here to support you all the way. But for now, let's get back to our revision lesson. Let's read it together quickly. I want you to write it down and I want you to think about it, okay? And in the time that we go on our ad breaks, I really want you guys to go and think about it and try this question. What we have got here is point A, which is negative 2 and 5, point B, which is negative 4 and negative 2, point C, which is 3 and A, and point D, which is B and 3. And these are four points on the Cartesian plane. So what they're asking us to do here is to determine the value of the A, here's the A, and the value of the B, which is over there, such that, now here's the important information, so you've got to read this carefully. What they're saying to us over here is that line AB is parallel to CD. So your line AB is parallel to CD, and your line AD is perpendicular to CD. Okay. So I'm going to give you a small push along in the right direction over here just to send you on the right track. And this is how you need to be interpreting this, grade 10s. If you've been told the two lines are parallel, okay, as I mentioned it a few seconds ago, parallel lines share the same gradient, okay? So to now take that information, actually start working with that as a sum, we're going to take the gradient of your line AB and you will make it equal to the gradient of your line CD. I hope that makes sense to you guys. And then we've been told that AD is perpendicular to CD. Okay, so what did we learn last week about that? The gradient of AD times by the gradient of CD has got to equal negative 1. Remember, they're the inverse of each other with the opposite sign. Right, so there we go. I've given you a bit of a push in the right direction. That's what I want you to please go and think about and give a try to. But in the meantime, let's start with some other examples and you can give that a try in our break. Okay. Right, let's get going with this question over here. They've said that in a triangle with vertices A, which is negative 1 and 7, B, which is 8 and 4, C, which is 5 and negative 5, is given. And they want us to show that... We should have a little copy there for our angle. Show that A, B, C is 90 degrees. So in other words, show that the angle B is 90 degrees. Okay. Right. Let's see. How would I go about doing this? I'm wanting to prove if something's 90 degrees, I'm wanting to prove that it is perpendicular. All right. So essentially, what I want to do is I want to prove that the line AB is perpendicular to the line BC. Okay. So let's see if we can go about doing that. Well, let's see if we land up with perpendicular gradients. So let's start with the gradient from A to B. Gradient, remember, is your change in Y. So Y1 minus Y2 over X1 minus X2. And let's see what we've got here. Gradient from A, A to B. I'm going to call that x1 and y1, and this I'm going to call x2 and y2. Remember last week I labeled them a lot because it's just easy to make a silly, silly mistake with regards to substitution. So just label them. It avoids anything, unnecessary mistakes. Okay, so y1, which I've labeled as 7, minus y2, which I've labeled as 4, over x1, which is negative 1, minus x2, which is 8. Okay, that's going to give us 7 minus 4, which is 3, and 8, negative 1 minus 8 is negative 9, and we can simplify that to a third. Okay, so we know that the gradient from A to B is a third. Let's see what the gradient from B to C is going to give us. I hope in your head you already know what the answer we're looking for should be, but let's see if we can <laughs> confirm that for you. Okay, what I'm going to do is take that out, and let's do it in a different color to not confuse anybody. So let's now call that x1 and y1, and x2, y2. Okay, so y1 minus y2, watch out for the double negative there, it becomes positive, over x1 minus x2. So I've got a 9 over, how am I right there? y1 minus y2 over x1, sorry, there's an 8. 8 minus 5, which is 3. 
and 9 divided by 3 is 3. So how do I know from that gradient and that gradient, how do I know that they are perpendicular? Well, if I take the two gradients and multiply them together, so in other words, if I took a third and I multiplied it by 3 over 1, what do we land up with? Negative 3 over positive 3 is the same as negative 1. So remember, guys, that's how we prove that the lines are perpendicular. So therefore, what is our conclusion? We're going to state that, therefore, angle B is equal to 90 degrees. We've proven it's perpendicular. We've got a nice diagram over here. This is quite typical grade 10s in terms of what you would receive in terms of a, a test question. So definitely get used to this kind of thing. Okay, so they've given us a diagram. It's obviously a quadrilateral, which we can see. And they've given us our points A, B, C, and D. And in this case, I can actually see they've given me all the coordinate points. There's nothing there that's missing, which is quite nice. Okay, so the first thing they're wanting us to do is to determine the gradient of the diagonals. Okay, so we're going to actually draw in a line here. The diagonal from A to C and from B to D. Okay. Right, so let's work out what the gradients of those would be. So my gradient from A to C is going to be, I'm going to call that X1 and Y1, X2 and Y2. Okay, Y1 minus Y2 over X1 minus X2, and I'm landing up with a 7 over a 7, and I'm getting a gradient of 1. Okay. All right, so that's the gradient from my diagonal A to C. My diagonal B to D, let's see what we've got over there. Let's call this, let's do it in a different color so we don't mix it up. So let's call that X1, Y1, X2, Y2. Okay, so therefore we have got 3 minus negative 4 over negative 3 uh, minus so we're going to land up with a positive 7 over a negative 7, which is negative 1. Okay, so what can we see from that grade 10s? We've landed up with a gradient of positive 1 and a gradient of negative 1. Looking at that, that should immediately tell me that I have got a perpendicular, I've got perpendicular lines over there. So there we go, those are actually intersecting at a 90 degree angle. Right, the next question following up from that. Are the diagonals of the quadrilateral perpendicular? Well, yes, because we've actually just proven that. So we had the two diagonals, and we proved that they were actually at a 90-degree angle. They intersected at a 90-degree angle. Give a reason for your answer. The reason the way we would go about doing that is we would do this. Let's just give ourselves some space here. The gradient from A to C times by the gradient from B to D was actually equal to negative 1. And therefore, the lines are perpendicular. Okay. Decula. All right, so that's just proving that a statement that's being made just to prove that the two lines are actually perpendicular. All right, following on from that, still the same question, just, in, just following on. They're now asking us to determine if the origin lies on the line BD. Okay, so let's see. My line BD is obviously this diagonal over here. And they're wanting us to determine if the origin actually does lie on that line, okay? Um, how would we go about doing that? Okay, well, the first thing I would say to you is that, well, the origin is the coordinates of what? Okay, it is the coordinates of naught and naught. Okay, so we're trying to establish that this pink line, just bear in mind that the uh, diagrams are not always to scale, so just watch out for that. But we're trying to prove that, in fact, it would actually pass through the origin. Let's find the equation of line BD. All right, we've already proven in the previous question that the gradients of that line was negative 1. So therefore, let's do this. The equation of a straight line graph is y equals ax plus q, where remember the a is your gradient, which we've already proven 
is negative 1. So that's all, that work has already been done for us. And to work out what the y-intercept is, what I can do is take either point B or I can take point D, it really doesn't matter which one, and substitute it into the x and the y. So I'm going to take point B just because, and I'm going to substitute y with positive 3, and I'm going to substitute x with negative 3. Okay, what does that give us? It gives me a 3 equals 3 plus q, and when I bring it over, I land up with naught being equal to q. So what's the equation of the line BD? Y is equal to negative 1x plus 0, okay? Well, that's telling me then that I've got a y-intercept of 0, all right? And if it's got a y-intercept of 0, it in fact absolutely is passing through the origin. It has to be, all right? So therefore, proven. We've proven that the line will be passing through the origin, okay? Another way we could just go about doing it, just in case you're interested, is that what we could do is take the coordinates of your origin, which is the point naught naught, and substitute it into the equation of the line BD. We can actually plug it x and a y with naught and naught. And the point of that is that if we get to prove that the left-hand side equals the right-hand side, you are proving that, it's, that it's, a true, it's true and it actually does sit on that line. So it's just another way of proving it, okay. Okay, looks. let's see what else we need to do here. Okay, still the same diagram. Now what they're asking me to do is determine the coordinates of the midpoint of the diagonal AC. Right, so let's just quickly draw those in again. So we had the diagonal from A to C and the diagonal from B to D. Proving that the coordinates of the midpoints of AC, okay, so basically what we're looking for is the halfway mark from A to C and B to D. So therefore, midpoint. The midpoint from A to C is going to be as follows. I'm going to take x1 plus x2 divided by 2 and y1 plus y2 divided by 2. Okay? That's going to give us a half over here, and I'm going to get negative uh, 1 over 2. So I've got positive a half and negative a half as the, the x and the y coordinates of the midpoint from my line A to C. Okay? Right, then I'm looking for the coordinates of BD, the midpoint from B to D. Okay. Okay, let's see. So from B to D, I'm going to have a negative 3. Oh, is that so? I think I just have done BD, actually. Oh, sorry, guys. I think I got my coordinates a bit mixed up there. I'll tell you what. What we want you to... Okay, you guys can actually work that out quickly. That's not going to be too difficult for me. Work them out. Um, if I'm not mistaken, we had a negative a half. Just quickly check your numbers. The midpoint for this one over here should be negative 3 over 2 and positive 3 over 2. And the midpoint for, the, for this one over here should be around about, a, if I'm not mistaken, it's positive a half, negative a half. Okay. All right, so that should be what the coordinates of your midpoint are. Just getting your numbers right there. Okay. What we want to do, however, with that is that they want to ask you, do the diagonals bisect each other, okay? Now, the whole point of the previous example is we worked out the midpoint of the one and we worked out the midpoint of the other. And by doing that, we should quite clearly see that we have two different midpoints, okay? That implies that the, the diagonals do not bisect each other. Because if they would, if they did, they would cross each other at exactly the same midpoint. So therefore, the answer to this, no, they don't bisect each other. Why? Because they don't share the same midpoint. Welcome back guys. I hope you're getting into the idea of revision. Please let us know how you are doing because I'd love to chat to you on Facebook and on Twitter. Enough of the chat, let's get back to revision now. Right, so we're going to get straight into an example of how to use simple interest. Uh, one thing, um, sorry, compound interest, just remember when you are dealing with compound interest, you're talking about an exponential increase in money. So if I had to graph it, Okay, if this depicts my compound interest, your money will grow 
like that. Okay, it will grow exponentially. Whereas if you were uh, calculating interest on a simple interest method, your money will grow on a straight line basis. Okay, so that's the difference. As you can see, after the first year of the investment, really your money starts growing quite a lot faster than it will on a simple interest method. Okay, so just a quick little uh, graph for you to depict and see what's happening. So when you're dealing with compound interest, we're looking at an exponential increase in money, which after the first year will become much higher than what you can get on a simple interest method. Okay, all right, so as I was saying, first example, right? They tell us that Tyrone invests 4,000 Rand for five years, at 15% per annum, compounded annually. They say find the future value, that's another way to say accumulated amount. Okay, sometimes you see that being used. All right, find the future value of the investment after five years and the interest that he receives. Okay, so they're asking you two things here. Firstly, what is the accumulated amount? And then next, um, what is the interest that he receives? So let's mark down. We know that he invests 4,000 Rand. So A is 4,000. I'm just going to rewrite. Sorry, P is 4,000. In fact, let me just get rid of that. So that's our P amount. Our principal original amount is 4,000 Rand. He invests it for five years. So therefore, N is equal to five at an interest rate of 15%, so therefore I is 0 0.15. And remember the way I got that is I took 15 and I divided it by 100. Okay, it's compounded annually. They want the amount of the investment after year five. All right, so we're going to use our compound interest formula. A is equal to P times 1 plus I to the power of n. Okay, so your n now, your number of years, is an exponent. We simply plug in our initial amount, which is 4,000, times 1 plus i, i being your interest rate, which is 0 0.15, and we're going to grow all of that for 5 years, so n is 5. Alright? Let's have a look at what we get there. So it's going to be 4,000 in brackets, 1.15. And this is all going to be to the power of 5. And that gives us 8,045 rand and 43 cents. So 8,045. 8,045. And... 43 cents. Okay, so that is the value of the investment after five years of compound interest. Okay, so five years of compound interest working on that value of 4,000 rand and you get an amount of 8,045 rand and 43 cents. Guys, what I want to do, because I know you would have done these kind of exercises at school as well, but I want to show you, just divert a bit from the question, I want to show you what would have happened if we worked this out using simple interest. So I'm going to do something that's slightly different, not really what the questions asked us to do, but I just want to show you if we had worked this out do using simple interest. Okay, so this is an aside. And in case you were wondering, well, what's the big difference between simple interest and compound interest? Have a look at this. If we were working out simple interest, we were going to say 1 plus 0 0.15, 1 plus 0.15, and then we times n is 5. Okay, and let's see what we get. So it's going to be 4,000, and then in brackets, 1 plus 0.15 times 5, and that's going to give us 7,000 rand. So as you can see, that's equal to 7,000 rand. That's quite a big difference, hey, in the same period, from 7,000 to 8,045 rand. You're making 1,045 rand more using your compound interest method 
versus simple interest. And that's why in the real world out there, when you're getting your investments in that, your investments are done on compound interest. We don't really use simple interest for investing of money because as you can see, you're going to get a much better rate on a compound interest formula versus a simple interest formula when we use the same interest rate. So 15% in both of these is going to be better using compound interest than simple interest. Okay, so I just wanted to show you that if you've got the same interest rate and you've got a choice, you rather choose to invest your money via compound interest. Okay, and what's important there is it's got to be the same interest rate. Okay, so I looked at 15% over the same time period. If, of course, you change the rates, then we're going to be talking about a completely different story. Okay, but basically, for our purposes for now, compound interest, 15% is going to be much better than simple interest, 15%. Okay, we get more money out. All right, so we get 8,045 rand on our compound interest formula, which is the value of the investment after five years. Then I then ask you for the interest he receives. So the interest he receives is just that extra bit, that bit that took his money from 4,000 to 8,045 rand. So if I want to work out the interest that he receives, I simply take 8,045 rand and 33 cents, and I minus the original amount which he invested, which was 4,000. 43 cents, hey? All right. And 43, 43 cents. cents. There we go. Okay. So that will give me 8,045 minus 4,000 will give me 4,045 rand. And 43 cents. Hey, Looney? Yes. Okay, so that's 4,045 Rand and 43 cents over that five year period. And that, remember, is just your interest. That's how much of interest he has earned in that five year period. And it's important that you guys distinguish between the interest that they earn and then the final amount because they are two completely different things. Okay. <laughs> So here we're told that 6,500 is de uh, deposited into a savings account, and I'm going to mark this on our timeline as we go through the question. Okay, so we start with time naught. There's our timeline. We're going to go from time naught. Okay, and they say 6,500 is deposited into a savings account, so that's the amount that's going into the account at time naught. Three years later, so now at time three, three years later, 7,400 Rand is added to the account. So we add in another 7,400. Then they say at the end of five years, so now at time five, they withdraw 5,800. Now guys, we use brackets to show a withdrawal. Okay, those of you who do accounting will be familiar with this, but generally when you're subtracting amounts out, you use brackets to show that it's less that amount. So at time five, the brackets around the 5,800 means that amount is coming out of the account. They want to know how much will be in the account at the end of 10 years, and they tell you that your interest rate is 11% per annum, so 11% is 0, 0,11. Okay. So I'm going to use method one in order to answer this question. So in method one, what I do is I move each amount to time 10. Okay, so each and every amount moves to that point in time, and then we add everything together. I think this is the most efficient way to do it, but if you don't like it this way, you can use method two. So this is all happening at time six. Okay, so we take the 6,500, remember always using our compound interest formula. So it's 1 plus the interest rate, rate of 0, 0,11. So it's 1 plus 0, 0,11, which is 1, 0,11. And that's in the account, in the savings account, from 0 to 10. And that's going to be, so from present time to 10 years later, so that's going to be for 10 years. Then at time 3, year 3, you have another 7,400 added into that account. And we work out the interest there from year 3 to year 10. That's 7 years. And then time 5, remember we're subtracting 
that amount out, the 5,800. So that amount is going to be subtracted out of the entire account at time 10. Okay, so if we're moving from time 5 to time 10, that's going to be a period of 5 years. All right. Okay, now that entire expression, you're just going to simply put that entire expression into your calculator and see what your final amount is going to be. So this is, remember once again, using the formula A is equal to P times 1 plus I to the power of N. And we want to know the final amount after we've changed and we've added and subtracted amounts. Okay, so let's use our calculator. So we've got... 6,500 and we have interest working on that for a period of 10 years. Okay, we then add another 7,400 rand um, three years later. So that's going to be the, in the account for a period of seven years. And then finally, you saw what happened is that they subtracted an amount of 5,000, or they withdrew an amount of 5,800 rand at time 5. So that's going to be 1, 1, 1 to the power of 5. Okay, and we end up with 24,000 rand, uh, 24,046 rand and 48 cents. Okay, so it's 24,000. And 46 rand and let's just recall the cents 48 cents okay so let's just go over what I've done here right how did I get that amount I simply said well if we're starting at time zero I work out what the value of the 6,500 rand is going to be at that point in time time 10 I then look at the 7,400 rand work out what amount that's going to be at time 10. We're subtracting an amount of 5,800 rand. So we're moving it to that point in time and say, well, how much will it be worth at that time? All right, and then you subtract and add all of the amounts at the specific time and you get an amount of just um, over 24,000 rand. Okay, so with the method I'm using, which is method one, you can only add things together if they're at the same point in time. Okay, so that's the important thing that you guys need to take out um, from this section. We are told that a mother invests 9,000 Rand in a savings account when her two daughters, <laughs> the N is missing there, when her two daughters are 7 and 10 years old. All right. She gives each of them 15,000 Rand in the year they turn 21. The interest rate is 11% compounded annually. How much will she have left in the account after she has given the youngest daughter 15,000 Rand? Okay, so at first it seems a little bit complicated because there's so much going on. There's two different kids, the one is seven, the other one's 10. They're both getting money when they're 21 years old. It all seems like a bit much to sort of digest and to just get an answer to. So this is when we need a timeline, okay? Typical example of when you're going to have to use a timeline to help you to answer a financial calculation. All right, so let's put the information we've got onto a timeline. Okay. So we we'll draw our timeline once again. And let's have a look at what's going on. So mother invests 9,000 rand into a savings account. Remember, we're starting at the present time. Everything's happening now, okay? She puts 9,000 rand into the savings account. So that's the first thing that she does. And at this point, when she's putting this money into the account, the one daughter is 7 years, and then the other one is... 10 years old. So obviously the younger daughter is 7, the older daughter is 10 years old. She will then give each of them 15,000 Rand in the year they turn 21. Now let's have a think about that, right? She's put this money in, say, today, 2013, August, right? 
and she's got two children, one is seven, one is ten. She's going to give them 15,000 rand in the year they turn 21. Now, obviously, it doesn't matter what year you're starting in. It's going to be the same amount of time because the seven-year-old is going to take 14 years to get to the age of 21, at which point she'll get the 15,000 rand, okay? And then the 10-year-old is going to take 11 years to get to the age of 21, and at that point she'll get... 15,000 Rand. Okay, so there's two separate things going on, but we can represent it on one timeline. Okay, so the seven year old, they wanted to know um, how much will she have when the youngest daughter, who's obviously the seven year old, gets her money of 15,000 Rand. Okay, so as I said, two different things, but one timeline. We know that the first daughter is going to get her money at time. Remember, she's 10 years old. She's getting the money when she's 21. So 21 minus 10 is 11. Okay, so she's getting her, her money in 11 years' time. The oldest daughter is then going to get her money. Remember, she's 7 years old. She's going to get the money when she's 21. So therefore, 21 minus 7 is 14. So she's going to get her money 14 years from now. Okay, the youngest daughter, 14 years from now, she'll get 15,000. The oldest daughter, 11 years from now, she'll get 15,000. So at this point in time, 15,000 Rand is going to go off the account. Remember, we use brackets to show that it's subtracted. And then at this point, time 14, another 15,000 is going off the account. Okay, and the interest rate that they've given us to work with here is 11%. So it's for the entire period. We don't have a change in interest rate. So your interest rate 0, 0,11. Okay. First thing we need to do is to work out the first time she gives the oldest daughter money, how much is going to be left in the account. But obviously at that point in time, at time 11, the money that she originally invested is going to have interest on it. Okay, so at that point, at time 11, all right, that 9,000 Rand is obviously going to have interest on it. Okay, so we take that 9,000, we say times 1, 1, 1 to the power of 11. At that point, we then subtract 15,000 Rand. Okay, because that's the money she is going to take off at that point in time. So it's 9,000 times 1.11 to the power of 11. And we're going to subtract 15,000 Rand. So at that point, she's got 13,365,882. Okay. Okay, so that's what's in the account, and I have rounded off there. That's what's in the account at time 11. We're then going to take that amount, see how much of interest she gets until time 14. So 14 minus 11 is now going to be 3 years, and we then subtract the other 15,000. So we're going to say 13, 3, 6, 5, 8, 2. We've got interest on that account for a period of 3 years, and then we subtract 15,000 and we get so it's that times by 1.11 to the power of 3 subtract 15,000 and she's going to be left with an amount of 3,279 rand in that account after she's given both her daughters their presents of 15,000 rand okay guys remember you can go over all of this on the website, all the notes are there, and if you have any questions and queries, just let us know from there. Um, but I think that's all we're going to have time for for this show, so okay. cheers.
Well, unfortunately, great tens, we have come to the end of today's show. But thank you very much for joining us and for chatting with me during the show. Remember, you can always visit our website, lenextra.co.za forward slash live to get all the notes and to watch the videos from the TEM. If you're stuck on any questions, don't hesitate to post them on helpdesk at learnextra.co.za forward slash helpdesk. From us to you, keep learning more and never give up. Peace.